The Mother of Oblivion and the Minarch Dynasty. Story continued from Necrons and Abundance Tertius Playlist. Utter carnage. My mind reels. I am aboard my flagship, watching a scene that I wished I had not viewed. Our superior sensors discern the depth of the massacre. Limbs floating in space. Whoever did this took the time out to not just flush the enemy into the cold void of space. But they dismembered all of them. Not one head is connected to a torso. Not one limb matched to its trunk. Some have even pulled or sliced off every digit. One presumes that the victims were all conscious while it was being done. I see the children of the old ones, their ships torn to pieces, some with obvious collision impacts. They were rammed. Such fanaticism, such unfettered cruelty. The level of spite is almost bottomless. A yawning chasm that can only be filled by atrocity. Only in those who have fallen to the flare curse have I witnessed such sheer unbridled hate. I am Kari Pasha, majestic lord of the shifting stars, herald of the night unending, keeper of the sempiternal tomb, humbler of the Kinib, a pharaoh of the Nefrek dynasty the warriors of the Golden Stars. And today, I have witnessed the crushing of the lesser races. Yet, this was not perpetrated by those who succumbed to the curse of Landragor, the flayed ones. For they are almost mindless things, and no fleet could be commanded by such as these. And it was an armada of our own that performed this work of what they must consider art. I have no love for the lesser beings. I never have. I have no soul to move me. I have scant hold of the ephemeral memories of such an emotion. It rises like an afterimage burned onto the eyes when one looks undefended upon the sun. It is nothing more than a memory of something that shone like a star. I almost feel it when I look upon my cursed consort, when she appears in the dark, watching me from the shadows. I always know she is there. Even before my senses detect her fully, I know it is not a thing of spirituality. I am beyond that now. No faith can touch that which does not exist. I have no soul to move me. I know she permits me to see her in the reflection of objects before she ever truly shows herself. In some small part of her mind, she must not want to shock or startle me. I doubt she knows what she does, what little of her mind destroyed by the flare curse. She is now nothing but hate and butchery. She wears disgusting tattered patches of the hides of the lesser beings, dripping their still flowing lifeblood on my marble floors. She lurks and stalks. Perhaps she feels the same afterglow of what we once had. Perhaps she will one day leap at me, and we will end each other in a flurry of talons and blades. My last element of romantic dalliance, that we would poetically end one another, something into each other's arms in our last fatal embrace. But then, for us, there is no waiting barge to take us to some infantile afterlife. There is no future, just a never-ending present and the gulf of the never-ending past. We are dead inside. We are the soulless. We are the Necrons. So where did this level of ire come from? 
Who could conduct such a slaughter? Our master has hung between systems for some time now, in the darkness where none can go but us. The lesser races move through the Sea of Souls, but do so via the ancient trails, those forged by the Old Ones. They do not venture into the inky space between the stars. With more forces arriving with each day, I marvel at the force being collected. A small green world. Yet it is of interest to the Triarch. The Silent King himself directs this congregation of our forces. I have not seen its like since, well, before the slumber. There are elements from a score of minor dynasties. I am considered one of the leading lights at present. Yet there are so many nemesaurs here, ever a fractious people. Tensions are rising, as there is no clear leader above them. And though I be a pharaoh, my force is meagre enough to negate the potence of my station. Like so many others, I have come via the dolmen gate that was dragged to this place. Out where none can see, none will be able to strike us. The dolmen gate. A parody of the tracks of the Old Ones, we force a hole into their realm and smash our own lines of ingress, travel and final exit. The others of rank bicker and jockey for position, preeminence. I rise above. I am here because the Silent King commands it. And while they bluster, I act. So it is that I discerned the vermin as they stalked our positions. A small skirmish had broken out with the Eldar. They probe us for weakness, to discover our numbers and strength. They too must on the other side of the star system, that is now teeming with the ships of the preserved witch corpse. Their craft were inbound, picket passing it would seem, where they faint and draw away our watch ships hoping a second wave to move past our lines to get closer to our muster, to discern our numbers. Inept children. We knew these tactics long before they were born as a race, let alone these pathetic husks of their former might. I chased them off, of course, but this time I followed them and I stumbled across the wreckage of the vessels that succored these smaller craft, and they are destroyed to the least and the last. It is then that I see the fleet that has done this. They are, unsurprisingly, ours. Yet whom? Andrakir? Or possibly even Zandrek? They send out no identification. I wheel my flotilla and set course for the main armada at our highest speed. As they go so languidly, I will be there when this individual arrives to take command. For surely, they are the ones who have been sent to lead the entire campaign. Why? Because they have multiple oversized Cairn class tomb ships. This is no Nemesaur. It is a dignitary, if luminous station. Hopefully, one able to cow the collected chattering generals and bring the order that will grant us victory. But whom? I am just in time to take my position amongst the collected warlords. They know. Sensors have picked up the new fleet arriving. They have still not identified themselves. And it begins. A shimmering image appears, a projection from the newcomers. Clarifying sigils shimmer into existence before us. The sign of Hapthatra, the Radiant. A mess of it, the Shadow Hand. And all attempt to resist, but none are able. Not even me. The re-established control protocols are too strong. When we see the next glyph, all are forced to their knees. It is the sigil of Zarek, the Silent King. And now, my own gift from the slumber takes effect. I do not see metal and necrodermis. 
I see the others as we were, breathing living things, enraged things. The next cliff offends all here so much, many rise, and in my mind's eye they scream their disgust. I see spittle flecks erupt from shouting generals, I see flesh fists waved in rage, I hear their voices as if we were still alive. There will be no honour in this campaign. How dare he? We will not fight under the likes of these. And so many other statements, but all of the same dint. The glyph is that of the honourless. The executioners of the silent king. The despised Minarch dynasty. Nothing calms when the next glyph appears. Their nemesaurs, the Minarch leadership, the jackal regent, Lord Hunter of the Void, Exatothek, Maktlan Kutlak, the extinguisher of life, the charnel lord, world killer, the god slayer. Then all are shocked into silence. All slowly return to their knees in supplication, myself included. How? Of all of our kind who went into slumber, if there was any justice in this horrific existence, they would not have survived the eons in stasis. It cannot be. But it is unmistakable. The glyph is that of the most terrible being amongst us. This will be a campaign drenched in fear and unspeakable atrocities. Honorless. It is the supreme Ferak of the Minarch dynasty. It is the fist of the Silent King. She who scours the stars. She who makes them weep. May all of the lesser races' gods grant mercy on their peoples. For she will not. For it is Zun Bakir, the mother of oblivion. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and faces of the Warhammer 40k universe, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace. There is only time for war. And today, we shall delve into the darkest of corners of the war to unearth a being and faction so terrible that they are scorned even by their own kind. Hailing from the very depths of antiquity, they were butchers and horrors even before they lost their souls. Twisted and terrible, they are led by none other than the only Ferak known to the galaxy. There may be more, of course, but we have heard naught of them so far. A woman so bloodthirsty, her people were despised by their own. From generals or nemesaurs, all the way down to the common foot soldier, they are a threat that cannot be overestimated, for they have already struck blows the kind that resound around the galaxy. Of course, I can only be speaking of the Minarch dynasty and their queen, Zun Bakir, the Queen of Oblivion. Even in the dark days of the first half of the war in heaven, where the Necrontier fought an attempted war extermination against their most hated foe, the Old Ones, the creators of both the Eldar, Krok, who became the Orcs, Kanib, Rashan, and Jakero, among others, lost to the sands of time. When the Necrontier were beaten back to their home world, there were some who believed the Minarch should have been refused refuge and be forced to be eradicated by their victorious foes, the Old Ones. They were detested by the Necrontier for a plethora of reasons, but the most ardent clarion call was due to their total and utter lack of restraint or decorum. For the Minarch did not wage simple wars of annihilation, as did so many of the other dynasties, and it was not out of compassion for the lesser races that they brought down such censure on themselves. For the Necrontier were beings who suffered such pain from their waking moment to their death, an excruciation that lasted their entire lives, never to be ignored, lessened or negated, no matter what they did or where they went. 
for the Necrontier. The universe was a harsh and punishing taskmaster that offered little mercy. So why should they do anything other than reflect the malice of a truly unfair universe? And so, they spared none in their expansion across the stars. But it was always done as dispassionately as one might exterminate an infestation of wasps or lice. But they were not given, usually, to cruelty. Callousness, of course, but it was not done with true spite. The Minarch and their terrible Ferak were not the same. Other dynasties saw them as sick and twisted and beneath their contempt. And in those times, despite the wars they waged, the Necrontier had high standards of honor. They had rules by which they would engage each other, or even those who had proven themselves worthy adversaries. In such cases, Certain elements of their forces and tactics would not be used. There was a certain decorum to the detachment, a standard that the Minarch shattered again and again. When the Silent King had prepared, when he had finally found the time right, it was the Minarch dynasty that were as vicious to their Catan masters as ever they were to the Old Ones and their warrior races. In fact, it is the Minarch who have been responsible for the only true death of a Catan, one of the Star Gods. For most were blasted and destroyed, indeed, but they were shattered into many fragments and their shards entombed in tesseract vaults and labyrinths. Not so for Landru Gore, the Flayer. The Minarch hunted him down and brought such force and spite to the battle that they did not just break him apart, they utterly annihilated him. Alas, this may have been the reason that in his last moments, Landragor, the ancient being, returned spite for spite and cursed both the Minarch and Necrontier race entire to the dreaded Flare virus, that which erodes their minds until they become flayed ones. Necrons who have an insatiable thirst for not just destruction, as normal Necrons might, but also a thirst they cannot ever sate for they crave blood and viscera, yet, as they are necrons, they can never consume it. They cover themselves in the skins and offal of those they slay, eternally attempting to slack a thirst to hunger that can never be satisfied, ever. Hence, it is some who blame the Minarch for the curse, as much as the destroyed Catan himself. And the enemies of the Minarch are not jumped-up minor dynasties or those attempting to jostle for position. No. Their greatest attractors were the Aton and the legendary Sautek dynasty. The most powerful of them all, bar that of the Silent King himself, of course. But back then, the Sautek were led by Pharon, not by the Breaker of Worlds, potentially not only the oldest and most experienced, but also the greatest general to have ever lived. Imatek the Stormlord. Hmm. I would now like to read an extract that covers a few tasty tidbits of lore indeed, taken from Imperial Armor Volume 12, The Fall of Orpheus. And so, as usual, for the very basics, let us lean on existing wisdom. To quote. Long before the war in heaven, the dynasty of the Minarch held a sinister reputation amongst its brethren. While their courage was unquestionable, there was a savagery and malice about them that the other royal courts found distasteful and uncivilized. Such malignance and obsessive ruthlessness was, however, of great use to the Silent King, and biotransference did not purge a darkness within them, but rather deepened it, emptying them of anything wholesome that may have once kept them in check. Due to the tyranny of the command protocols implanted during their transformation, the Minarch therefore remained unflagging soldiers in the war against the Catan and the red-handed agents of the Silent King's will. Not even the great overlords of the Necron Crown world well remember the battles against the Star Gods, for causality itself was damaged by the forces unleashed to dismember the Catan and the Silent King was one to remove the knowledge of the dreadful weapons employed from his warriors after the fact, in fear of what might later be done with them. 
but legend has it that it was at the hands of the Minarch and by the will of the Silent King that the Qatar known as Landrugor, the Flayer, was not merely shattered but obliterated. And at the moment of his death, he visited a curse upon his betrayers who were infected with an echo of his dark entity's terrible hunger for life. This may hold some sliver of truth, or may be no more than an outright fabrication whispered by the rivals and enemies of the Minarch dynasty to defame them. Regardless, these tales have been perhaps extrapolated from observable fact, as it is certain that some of the first instances of the Curse of the Flare were encountered amongst the sinister courts of the Minarch and its legions. As this affliction runs deep, and most often painfully slowly through their ranks, rotting the dynasty to its black-hearted core. The stench of blood that attends to them therefore saw them all but outcast from their kindred during the aftermath of the Catan's defeat and their domains exiled to the lifeless and turbulent reaches of the galactic southwest at the edge of the beyond where once, in the cold darkness, they had hunted across dead worlds to purge the last remnants of the Old One's servants during the dying ages of the war in heaven. Even when the great sleep was enforced on his soulless race by the Silent King, there were those, amongst them the Pharons of the Sautek and the Aton, that secretly counseled for the Minarch's destruction. So eager were their brethren to be rid of them once and for all. The Silent King, however, had use for them yet, and ensured their crown world was hidden not merely from interlopers, but from the other Necron dynasties as well. For all the canker that festers within their machine minds and lurks ready to erode them into horror, the Minarch are both numerous and strong. Counted not far behind the greatest dynasties in terms of direct military might, they were hampered in their advancement and supremacy by the distrust of others of their kind and their ill fame. Such indeed was their infamy that long-term rivals would even set aside feuds and grievances, however temporarily, to ensure that the Minarch in turn did not over-prosper in the endless rounds of power plays, vendettas and intrigues that typified the Necron civilization both before and after they gave up their natural lives. This in turn led the Minarch to take what they wanted through naked, unrelenting aggression, where more subtle means were barred to them, and what client dynasties the Minarch took to their power, they did with the threat of extermination. When the Nemesaurs of other dynasties might have condemned the Minarch's legions and nobles for lack of subtlety and strategic elegance, none could deny the brutal effectiveness of the armies of the Minarch dynasty. However, matters worsened as time progressed, and increasing numbers of the Minarch upper echelons began to fall to the curse of the Flare, devolving into insensible beasts of blood-spattered metal. Those of the royal court of the Minarch that did not succumb outright, instead began a torturous slow descent into homicidal madness, until only the twisted echoes of the ancient war codes and vaunted honor of the Necrons remained. Lost like ghosts in the matrices of their android systems, the ritualized patterns of warfare to which they had once fanatically adhered now formed compulsions to be dealt with before a fresh genocidal slaughter could be enacted. Meanwhile, the main arc overlords themselves demanded ever greater numbers of a bewildering variety of war machines from their cryptax servants with which to wage war and maintain their outright strength against their many enemies. It might have been supposed, not least of all by the Minarchs themselves, that the great sleep, when it came, might spell the long, slow death knell of their dynasty. That in the silence of the stasis crypts, over immeasurable time, the curse would have its way, and what would waken at last would be no more than a tide of mindless ghoul automata, without cause or reason, but to slake a hunger that could never be satisfied. This indeed had happened unexpectedly elsewhere, through the vicissitude of dark fate such as with the Bone Kingdom of Jazak, or, in the case of the benighted Orosok dynasty, by the insidious instigation of the Eldar. This was not, however, to be. The worlds of the Minarch slept hidden to all but the Triarch Praetorians, set to stand watch over them by the Silent King, and the sleepless malice that had fashioned their layer after layer of concealments and murderous defenses. Founded on the galactic rim and an area routinely troubled by violent celestial phenomena, particular attention was paid to outfitting the Minarch tomb worlds 
with solar manipulator arrays and hyperspatial flux generators at great cost to shield them from calamity. This foresight secured them from harm where many other tomb worlds elsewhere fell prey to the blind destructive forces of stellar evolution, while the barren and turbulent void around their realm offered little to tempt the expansionist desires of many younger races who rose and fell as ages passed them by. Intrusion was rare, but when detected, the paranoia of the Minarch took no chances, and offensive intelligences responded with absolute violence to any that happened upon their master's slumber. Not simply content with eliminating trespassers, instead entire phalanxes of Necron warrior machines and canoptic killing engines would be dispatched to seek, locate and destroy any nearby population center or star vessel so that no witness or knowledge of them would remain. Such a plan could have backfired by calling down greater wrath than the slumbering tomb worlds could cope with, but through the short-sightedness and insularity of the greatest threat that arose unaware on the Minarch dynasty's borders, the expansion of the Imperium, even that final opportunity was missed and the time of awakening came. Long implanted in the tomb worlds of the Minarch was a trigger to summon their awakening, a configuration of celestial movement, a sign in the black heavens which the lifeless eyes of the canoptic intelligences would register and thus mark an end to their eons-long vigil, the death of the Caracol binary stars. Here no Necron slumbered, but on the dead worlds of Caracol, instead were the graves and ruins of entities more ancient and terrible even than they, cast amidst the dolmen gates the Catan had used to wage their war in heaven. Whether by the hidden hand of the Silent King, the interventions of other, more nightmarish forces, or simply blind cosmic chance, in the year 990, millennium 41, by the Imperium's reckoning, the Caracol binary stars went supernova. Their death shredded their ancient haunted worlds that orbited them, and whatever secrets they contained in a detonation of annihilating energy that, because of the Dolmen Gates, was amplified and transmitted as a shockwave of blind force into the warp beyond. The pattern of the stars was forever changed, and the cursed Minarch arose. The Minarch core worlds awoke and hungered. While thousands rose from their millennia-long slumber, screaming and insane for blood and flesh, many more quickly succumbed in the aftermath of the great revivication of the stasis crypts, forming ravening packs of flayed ones that haunted the shadows in a fruitless quest for slaughter. However, hundreds of thousands of Minarch, from warriors to Lich Guard, were spared that immediate fate and rose from their armored tombs in serried ranks ready for war. The curse of the flare had not undone them all, but instead, in many of its nobles and cryptics, it had sunk into the depths of their cybernetic consciousnesses, subsuming its malignancy into twisted reflections of itself and corrupting what remained of the personalities and drives of the once proud warriors of the Minarch dynasty. Perhaps through their own inherent bloodlust, some of the Minarch had some strange kinship and thereby resistance to the terrible affliction, or perhaps they were simply condemned to a longer span of suffering. For some, the curse would take hold in mere hours, in some, years, and in others, it would perhaps take centuries or millennia to come to fruition, but all bore the mark of the flare upon them like a stain. However, in the mind of each Necron Lord and Cryptek came the clawing cold realization that even the distant dream of a return to whole life in an organic form might well be denied to them by the curse of blood they carried and the horror which had overtaken them, and truly, they were lost. Many fled from this realization into delusion and madness. Some embraced a nihilistic hatred of all life, like the destroyers, while others gave themselves over to carnage wholesale, embracing their own end. But what saved the Minarch dynasty from falling into a spiral of self-destructive anarchy was the inviolable will of its rulers, as the deepest and most heavily protected tomb worlds opened at last, and names were uttered aloud for the first time in sixty million years, 
the mention of which had once made whole worlds tremble in fear, and would soon do so again. Ixatotec, the Jackal Regent, Lord Hunter of the Void, Talazolt, the Faceless, Nemesaur of Tayrock, Maxlan Kutlak, the World Killer, and finally, their Dark Princess, Fair Akzun Bakir, the Mother of Oblivion. With brutal willpower, they brought order to the awakening tomb worlds and took counsel from the corroded and time-worn Praetorians who had stood vigil down the corridor of time and their chronomancers who called on their strange devices to pierce the veils of space and distance. In airless black vaults of killing cold, they took stock of their domains and the upstart vermin which had infected the stars in the age in which they had awoken. Slumbering tomb worlds of other dynasties nearby would either bend the knee or be labelled as enemies themselves and dealt with accordingly. The Silent King's command protocols were gone, and nothing would stop the Minarch from attaining supremacy now. Their course of action was clear. Genocide. The systematic annihilation of all life that opposed them. But first, they would display the patience of a spider spinning its web. Borders would be probed, legions marshaled, war engines tested, enemies isolated and identified, and plans laid. All of this would be done before the fringe worlds that had been usurped by the vermin identified it as mankind, who arrogantly thought them theirs. Only then would the legions be unleashed. Hundreds of thousands of warriors, millions of canoptic constructs and warships without number. This would not be war against an honored foe, but a dark harvest of the living. An extermination campaign on an interstellar scale. And the spoils of war, the flesh and blood of the slain, would be harvested and given to appease the wayward children of the Minarch as a mercy for the afflicted. And no other reason. The soulless nobles of the court told themselves, no other reason at all. End quote. Now all of this is mere history, one might think, that the Minarch dynasty is just a boogeyman from the distant past. Yet, it is this dynasty that has brought one of the most crushing defeats the Imperium has ever received from the hands of a sentient Xenos race. Once, there was an entire sector that had been taken and held for some four millennia. The Orpheus Sector. Conquered by the Imperium in circa millennium 37, it had subsequently survived orc migrations, chaos infestations, and more than a few civil wars. Yet, when the Necron legions of the Maynarch attacked, they did not do so in pockets or with tentative strikes and pathways of ingress. When they did attack, they assaulted scores of worlds at the once slaughtering everything before them. The Imperial defenders barked out astropathic calls for aid to everyone in their region, and it was not lackluster PDF for some fresh regiments that came to match the call. Oh no. It was regiments for Necmunda and the Death Corps of Krieg that came, along with Space Marines. Yet things did not go as they usually do when these indefatigable warriors take to the field of combat in the defense of the Emperor's realm. An entire chapter of Space Marines, the Angel's Revenant, were annihilated at their home on Libertha. They fought hard, but they were utterly crushed by the Maynarch. The Battle of Amara was the crux of the engagement, and I shall be covering that intensely soon, as it is quite a ride. Yet. There is no time for this engagement to be discussed in all of its gory glory today, but it is coming. And so we must sum up. The Maynarch have a thirst for victory that is second only to that of the Sautek. They have won successive victories since their waking, expanding and absorbing minor dynasties left and right. They build their strength like an avalanche with each such conquest. They are the hidden dagger, the most loyal to the Silent King by his own dynasty or his Praetorians. Emotek the Stormlord now rises and perhaps attempts to wrestle power from his king. Surely, Cesarek will have no choice but to unleash the Minarch. Led by Mac Clan and, most brutal of all, Zun Bakir, 
the mother of oblivion herself. Now that is a battle I would like to see, and the pariah nexus may be exactly where they strike first. Join me next video as I recount the tale of the battle where the Maynock crushed the death core of Krieg easily. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. If you have enjoyed this video, then do consider liking and subscribing, and do check out our videos on mythology, links in the description. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.